I'm Chuck Connors. I've come to the Las Vegas Strip to witness something so spectacular that most people won't believe it without seeing it. I'm standing in front of the Imperial Palace, one of the most modern hotels in Las Vegas, also one of the tallest. It's more than 200 feet high. That's a long way up from here. It's even higher if you're on the top coming down. Imagine stepping off the top balcony, falling all the way, and surviving. Impossible? One man thinks he can do it. He's a man with unbelievable talents who's worked his way halfway around the world to get here. He's a world record holder, a professional stuntman from Czechoslovakia. His name, Peter Horak. He's been known to leap from tall buildings with a single bound, drive boats through the air, and get very heated up over his job. Peter plans to step off the balcony from the top floor and fall all the way. He's an expert at this sort of thing. If it can be done, I'll bet Peter can do it. A few years ago, there wasn't a man on earth who would try this. Now Peter is willing to gamble his life on the ultimate personal test. Peter, how long have you been preparing for this stunt? I've been intending for many years, since I came to America in 1968. That's about 13 years. 13 years. What was the uh, greatest problem you faced? It took me a thousand hours to build my airbag. My biggest problem was to find a building I could jump from, or I could have permission. We searched through three different states, and finally here in Las Vegas, we got permission from Imperial Palace. Uh -huh. So I feel really grateful to them. Yeah. Well, you're about to do the greatest stunt of your life. The whole world is watching you. You've actually reached the top of Las Vegas. Now, that's been a long, hard road since Czechoslovakia. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel pretty good now. Everything is ready just to go. And my dad, he came from Czechoslovakia. He'll be watching me. So I hope I do a good job. Peter, you amaze me. Here you are about 20 or 30 minutes away from actually jumping, and you seem so serene and so calm. How do you manage that? When you do a stunt like that, Chuck, you have to be really cool and right on the button. Peter won't wear any safety gear. No parachutes, no safety wires, no stretch cords. It's a pure, unaided fall, the most dangerous kind. Many stuntmen won't do high falls. They're too dangerous. Even a 50-foot fall takes intense concentration. They leave this kind of stunt to specialists like Peter. If he miscalculates and misses the airbag, he'll be killed. If the airbag can't take the impact, there's nothing else to break his fall. Peter doesn't attempt this lightly. He's trained for this moment for years, conditioning not only his muscles, but his reflexes, his balance, and his timing. More than a year of work went into the construction of one of the world's largest airbags. Inside, it's awesome. It stands 26 feet high, 45 feet wide, and 55 feet long. It weighs 700 pounds. Peter made it himself out of the strongest material he could find. Peter has a volunteer named Otto who will make a test jump before he does. The airbag suffers no damage. And I Otto is a dummy my, loaded with sophisticated my, my impact airbag. meters. The meter readings tell so Peter how much to adjust the vents nice for maximum okay. cushioning. This is really soft. The no, test it's is successful. No, it's perfect. Now it's Peter's turn. Peter, I gotta tell you, that airbag doesn't look too big from up here. Think you can really hit it? Why don't you try it yourself? Find out. Oh, thanks, Peter. I'll take the elevator. I'll see you downstairs. Good luck. As he stands poised on the brink of eternity, Peter reflects on how long this fall will take to happen. It seems like forever. In all, 25 years. It started that long ago in Czechoslovakia with a young boy who had a taste for far horizons and a yearning for a new land he had read about in American books and seen in American movies. I can remember the forest and mountains near our little village. I was born in the capital city of Czechoslovakia in uh, Prague. When I was three years old, we moved to a little village named Mikulovice. It was a good place to grow up. I spent there all my childhood. 
In Czechoslovakia in the 1950s, there was lots of time for a boy to be alone and think and dream. Peter dreamed of running to faraway places where no fences could imprison him. Thousands of miles along the west side of Czechoslovakia is an electrified fence. It is very high voltage, and beyond that are mine fields. They look like farmers' fields, but if you step on a mine, bang, you get blown up. And there are soldiers. They carry machine guns, and they look for anybody trying to get out. His restless spirit was a source of pain and embarrassment to his family. More than once, his father had to collect him out of a local jail for actually trying to run across the border. Always they caught me, Russians. They don't want you to have better living. You just have to do what they say and just work for them. Unless you went to work in a factory, uh, there is not very much to do in Czechoslovakia but to be a sportsman. One good thing about communist countries is that they help you with sports. You don't have to pay for instructors or training. Uh, I started judo when I was 15 and I went to junior championships when I was uh, about 16 years old. Uh, I'm 38 now, that's 23 years in a judo. Peter served a mandatory two-year term in the army as a radio telegrapher. Trouble seemed to follow him there, too. Army discipline was not his idea of fun. Occasionally, he got ideas of his own, like breaking out of camp to drink beer and chase girls at a local tavern. I got my black belt after I got out of the army the first year. I went to the championships of Czechoslovakia and I won. I had my fastest match. It was over in two seconds. I won in two seconds. Our team also won the championship. I would sit there with my grandpa under the tree. My grandpa, he read me books about America. So I wanted to go there one day. And I knew someday I would make it. In 1968, Peter received an invitation from the state to go to an international judo competition in Holland. He knew that this was his chance to get out. It wasn't as easy as he thought. When I was leaving, no one knew I was not coming back. I didn't tell my family because they might be scared for me and because of secret police. I looked at my mother and father and to myself I was saying goodbye to them. And I knew I might never see them again. My mother looked into my eyes and I think she knew I wasn't coming back. She died a couple years later and I never saw her again. It was 12 years before I saw my father and brother again. In Amsterdam, his decision was finalized by much more powerful forces. Russia invaded his homeland. He knew he could never return home now. 
I was always running since I was a little kid. Now I had to run a long way. He asked for political asylum in Amsterdam, thinking he was safe. Instead, his travels and his difficulties were just beginning. Officials in Amsterdam refused him asylum. My visa expired and I had to run away from Dutch police. So I took off across Belgium. I was carrying all my luggage with me and had no money. So I sold one old Russian coin and made a few bucks. I had to sleep outside under the trees. Finally I made it to the French border. But they wouldn't let me in. They said, you have to go back. Boy, they got me mad. I went five miles around and jumped over the fence. I even didn't care if they had an electrical fence or not. I hitchhiked all the way to Paris. At midnight I knocked on the door at the police station and asked for political asylum. But instead they threw me in a jail. I really didn't mind, at least I could take a warm shower and have a nice sleep. After a couple of days they figured out my papers and let me go. I found that the big ship is leaving for New York. So when the guards went looking, I just jumped on the luggage escalator. Once I got on board, Captain was having a welcome party, so I joined them too. It was a good party. I had a good time. Finally I made it to New York, but the immigration and FBI wouldn't let me stay. After all the long trip I could almost touch the land, but they wouldn't let me in. So I had to go all the way back to France on the same boat. And again, no food, no money and no work. When I needed it most, help came from the Canadian and bus in Paris. They set up my immigration papers and gave me a ticket to Toronto, and I'll never forget that they helped me. It was the end of August 1968 when I got to America at last. In Toronto, Peter continued his judo training several times a week. In the years to come, he became the New York State champion in the open division and first in the featherweight class of the North American championships. His fastest time for defeating an opponent in international competition still stands as a record, two seconds. In slow motion, you can see the stresses his body has to take. In a typical workout, he conditions his body to be able to take punishment by absorbing shocks. Judo is valuable to Peter because it offers better overall body conditioning than most sports. If his body can take this, it can take anything. Peter now had a plan to use his judo abilities to earn himself a living. It would be a whole new career one which would place some pretty tough demands on his body. To Peter, America was Western movies. While growing up, he saw every Western that came to Czechoslovakia. But it was Yakima Knut's famous horse transfer and under the coach drag scene in Stagecoach that impressed him enough to give movie stunt work a try. In the movies, the first stuntmen were cowboys. So when I started, I wanted to be the same and learn horse stunts. His first attempt at horse stunts was unrewarding. One of the few injuries Peter has ever suffered happened before his career had even started. The first week he rode a horse. The horse slipped on ice and fell, costing him a broken collarbone. Bulldogging is just one of the several types of horse falls. He began to practice horse techniques whenever possible, and soon he began learning from other stuntmen. To meet the demands of film work, he had to be able to fall off a running horse in every possible position, including backwards. And so Peter practiced, and practiced, and practiced. And took a beating in the process, 
That's part of the job. Unless his body stays in top shape, this kind of wear and tear can be dangerous. Knowing how to fall can make life a little easier. Peter's new friends in Toronto thought he was crazy to think about stunt work. How could he compete against the professionals in Hollywood? Most of his life, he had been doing things that other people thought were crazy. Climbing cliffs, jumping from windows, even falling from horses. These things weren't crazy to him. They were just challenges to be met. He knew that the career he was choosing would be a long, hard climb to success. The higher his climb, the greater the dangers, like any important career. But the rewards would be worth the struggle. Peter is a born sportsman. Once he felt what it was like to live off his own muscles and nerves, he knew the dream he had long ago in Czechoslovakia would come true. He had achieved the first step, and possibly the most important. He had his goal. Now the training had to begin. Peter was determined to get into the best shape he had ever been in. Now must begin the effort of a lifetime. If there is weakness in my body and mind, then I know I won't make it. I must be strong. He became his own trainer. I like swimming, especially in the ocean. Czechoslovakia is the heart of Europe, and we don't have an ocean. There are plenty of rivers and lakes. We can only swim in them two or three months out of the year. When I was a little kid, a big guy threw me in the river. I almost drowned. Then I started paddling and kicking around. That's how I got my first lesson in swimming. Swimming develops muscles. It improves endurance and rhythm. And it stimulates him to learn and master related sports such as scuba diving, water skiing, and surfing. By 1974, he had appeared in several Canadian television movies and series. With credits under his belt, he felt ready to make one last big journey, the place he had dreamed about for 20 years. And so he came to Hollywood. In many ways, it wasn't quite what he had expected. However, he learned to adapt to what was needed. Fencing was something Peter learned in Czechoslovakia. It requires excellent coordination and lightning reflexes. It's made more difficult by the demands of fight choreography on sheer cliffs. In a swashbuckling scene, the stuntmen must avoid looking awkward on the slippery rocks. At the same time, they have to make it look dangerous while not hurting each other with the swords and still hit their marks for the cameras. Peter's first job in Hollywood was in a low-budget film called Alliance. He choreographed all the stunts and performed most of them himself. He began to prove immediately that he was a man with many talents. Peter had always been fascinated by stunt falls. I guess the danger appealed to him, and the challenge. One of the first stunts I wanted to improve when I got to Hollywood was high falls. 
I would practice almost every day. It feels like uh, flying when you fall, but you have to be in control. I think every fall you have to treat like it is your first one. If you don't concentrate, you can overshoot an airbag, or come short, or land wrong. California itself opened up new opportunities to try different sports. Everybody thinks surfing is fun. Surfing is one of the toughest sports I ever know. It's even tougher than motorcycle riding. It's kind of same balance, similar balance like the skin, but it's more difficult than skin. You have to have better balance. He might never need to surf for a film, yet still he spends hours practicing each week. With every wave, his body memorizes the motion and balance required. Eventually, it all becomes instinct. Much of his time is spent alone. The excitement, the danger, the glamour of making movies is a long way away most of the time. One of the most popular sports in Europe is riding a bike. Usually you start very young. It gives you something that you need when you are a kid. A little freedom. When you are pumping on a bicycle and your muscles work hard and in a rhythm, you can feel your mind relaxing as you travel through the country where it's peaceful and quiet. He's always looking for new techniques. In stunt work, where things happen too fast to think about, Peter has to depend on his body knowing instinctually what to do. Balance, Coordination, timing, they all have to become instinctive reactions. To keep in a shape as a stuntman, you have to do lots of sport activities. And that helps you in the business because they would say, this guy can do anything, he can do any kind of sport, he can do any kind of stunt. I know stuntmen, they are still good, even if they are 70 years old. One of my goals is to keep in the business at least till 55, so I can still be pretty active. Training the body can bring with it relaxation and enjoyment that makes the body strong and the spirit thankful. One of my specialties is power boat stunts. I like boat chases because of the speed and the precision it takes to work with them. Peter has acted as a stunt coordinator on 21 pictures. A stunt coordinator has to not only know how the stunt should be performed, he's got to make sure they're safe. He's always searching for what can be done to give the scene the most excitement. Imagination is as important as technique. Peter planned and performs this boat chase with his assistant Brad Bovey and a stunt crew of four. Peter works closely with the cameraman so that the cameras can pick up maximum boat contact without being endangered.
Peter maneuvers the 2,000-pound boat within inches of the wide-angle lens. It could have been an ordinary chase scene, but Peter decided to throw in something extra that had not been tried before just to make things a little more interesting and a lot more dangerous. This is it, a mid-air transfer and boat drag at 55 miles an hour. There is no room for mistakes here. The propeller is three feet away from his legs. One slip and he could be sucked under. Staging a fight like this in a driverless boat can easily get out of control without close supervision by the safety crew. Even so, a boat chase like this is child's play compared to another kind of stunt that Peter considers one of the two most dangerous stunts he has ever attempted on a regular basis. Extremely deadly firebird. Peter was one of the first stuntmen to experiment with a fireproof gel from Australia, which is opening the doors for fabulous fireburn stunts using less and less protection. He decided to try doing fireburns with no protection other than the fireproof gel. His body is soaked completely with the gel. Once he is covered, there can be no delay. The gel only works while it is still wet. Once it dries, it offers less and less protection from flames. Rubber cement is smeared on a pair of swim trunks. He must be extremely careful not to let the glue drip on his skin or it could burn a hole right through him. He calls it a nude fire burn because the flames actually make contact with bare skin. He is surprised that it gets hot enough to be felt. There is no breeze to fan the flames away. Since this is a first time stunt and the flames are unpredictable, it lasts only a few seconds. Mountain climbing is something different, and I spend a lot and a lot of weekends just practicing climbing till my fingers are bleeding and all. Sometimes I need a stuntman who can do some climbing. Say, it helps me if you do some chasing scene up on the roofs. Say, you have to jump across building, climb up on the balcony, jump down, slide down, and it all helps just because you know how to do mountain climbing. What millions of people regard as a relaxing pastime becomes another test for muscles and reflexes. Tennis provides an explosive release of his energies. Peter pits himself against George Vital in a match that lasts all afternoon. George has been a world-class player for 20 years. He has competed in many international tournaments and was at one time ranked fifth in the world. For Peter, it's hard work, brutal hard work. That's why he likes it. Tennis is good for running. You have to be really fast too. It's kind of tough sport because you run, all your body moves with the ball when you hit. And I lose a lot of weight sometimes. I lose seven, eight pounds just playing tennis for a few hours. to do your job good and 
just to picture in my head what I'm supposed to do, whatever producer or, or director asks me to do. If he isn't confident in his abilities, he will fail as a stuntman. It's that simple. The most important part of all is to know his limits. Then the danger can be controlled. You can't be worried about a, a danger. If you start to be worried about a danger, then you handicap yourself and, and you out of the performance. You know, then you can do a, a job good because maybe you're shaky, you're scared, you're not so sure. But again, if there was safety there, if something happened, if you break all rules of safety, one day you can get it really badly. And that's what happens a uh, few, few stuntmen in Hollywood. And, and they paid for it uh, their lives. Peter is one of a rare breed, an all-around stuntman. It demands constant, endless training, seven days a week. Peter has learned and mastered more than 20 different sports. His training and dedication have paid off. え、こちら8平方メートルの上から、え、こちら8平方メートル厚さ3メートルの山の上に飛び降りるということなんです。え、ピーターホークさんの姿がビルの屋上に見えました。両手を上げて。飛び降りた。降りました。このピーターホークさ
sit behind a chair and just maybe do typing on typewriter eight or ten hours a day and that's it. You know, I do it all my life. I don't think I could do that. I think my most important goal is um, to be one of the best stuntmen. I don't have to be the number one, but be one of the best stuntmen. He hopes to be remembered for his work as he remembers the past greats like Harvey Perry, Yakima Canute, Davy Sharp, whose work inspired him to be a stuntman. Peter faces many personal challenges, but Peter is like all the rest of us. The hardest challenge for him is the same one we all face in our own lives, and it's the hardest one of all, the challenge of excellence. On a grand scale, a total fire burn can be terrifying to watch. In the midst of 500 degree flames, Peter still has to act for the cameras. Yeah. Just put like gloves together, socks. It takes two and sometimes three safety men to dress him in 30 pounds of protective gear. It gets hot under all those clothes and that creates another problem. Now, if you sweat and you don't have enough insulation, you can get blisters from the heat which you pick up from outside, your own sweat start to boil and you get burned from your own sweat, from steam. Peter has a secret ingredient in his arsenal of safety equipment to handle just such a problem. I still use it because it's a quite a good idea. I use um, a baby powder and you should put it everywhere, all over the body. That keeps you really dry. Uh, sounds like a commercial, but... <laughs> Give a little bit. Come on. Each time he dresses for this stunt, he remembers the closest he has ever come to serious injury. He was shooting an episode of the television series Emergency at Universal Studios. I remember it like today. Car exploded, and I had lots of rubber cement and gasoline on me, and I just, I just exploded in flames. I knew right away, that's it, I'm gonna get burned. And I was getting burned all over my face, and I could feel it. I stopped breathing too. If I start breathing, I would probably get burned my lungs because they cover me completely and I, I was cooking inside like potato. You completely covered with asbestos, you're burning inside. Through your fingers, you can see flames coming towards your eyes. Special heavy duty fireproof boots protect his feet. What, what? You can tell us. We're getting close. I cannot wait too long, guys. Are you almost ready for it? His outer suit is a luminized fiberglass cloth which can withstand even the heat generated by a gasoline fire burn, the hottest kind. He has made a special fiberglass helmet to enclose his head. Still feel cool? Yeah. His body is encased with so many coverings that he has to fight the feelings of claustrophobia that make this stunt so distasteful. His helmet is sealed shut with non-flammable putty. When his faceplate is closed, he is so completely sealed in that it feels like a tomb. Since no air exists for him in a total fire burn, he breathes from an oxygen cylinder through a tube. The final step is just to, uh, just to put rubber cement or gasoline and, and light you on the fire, that's it. In a fire burn, you have to depend on other people, and that's kind of scary. His greatest fear is to lose control over the stunt. A total fire burn can easily get out of control. His signal to put him out is when he hits the ground. He has trained his safety crew to react instantly. The CO2 smothers the fire and cools at the same time. 
Ever since his close call, Peter has felt differently about fireburns. If it depends on his muscles or coordination, he has complete confidence. But the most frightening thing to a man like Peter is to trust his life to the hands of someone else. In all movies, always somebody got hurt. You know, somebody got killed, somebody got crippled. But we never forget these stuntmen, because we learn from their mistakes and we try to improve our methods. Maybe stuntmen are better today than 50 years ago. It's just because we learn from them. Always young stuntmen learn from old. If you do a stunt well, you don't get hurt. Peter believes that injuries and accidents happen as a result of poor planning and testing. That's why he's spending half a day preparing to test the most complex piece of equipment that he uses. The air ram is a collection of solenoid valves and electrical wiring and air tanks with 2,000 pounds of air pressure. When the air pressure is released, it acts like an explosion. A pyrotechnics expert is called in to create an explosive effect without using any dynamite. The powder man makes a special bomb using a black powder charge. When the bomb is detonated, it will create a fireball explosion. What's going to be the size of the fireball? It'll run about 20 to 30 feet in diameter at the maximum. Yeah. That's pretty nice. It might cover me a little bit. Yeah, it should, it should give the illusion that you're coming pretty much out of the fire. Yeah, yeah. but I'll be gone. By the time it, it blows, I'll be gone. Yes. <laughs> Only 10% of Peter's time is spent actually doing stunts. The other 90% is spent planning, testing, and double-checking safety measures. The mechanism can be extremely hazardous to work with. It's so powerful and it triggers so fast that a mistake can send a man to the hospital. It has the power to break hands, arms, and even a man's legs. Peter's safety crew takes to the water to await his signal. Finally, everyone is ready for the test. He must press the firing button at just the right instant. His timing must be perfect. If his body is in the wrong position, the air ram could break his back. Going off a 40-foot pier is just one of the ways Peter has invented to use an air ram. For a recent commercial, he was called upon to do an air ram stunt with skis on. Got it? Okay. It weighs a thousand pounds. It took months to build. It took four men an entire day to erect. It is designed to launch a 2,200 pound boat through the air farther than anyone has ever done before. It's Sunday, April 26th, 1980. Peter will attempt to set a new world record for a boat jump. Safety is the biggest factor, especially when you do stunts you have never done before. Four weeks before, I was picturing in my mind how I'm gonna approach the ramp, how fast, how perfect straight I must be. Even when I'm relaxing, just before I go to sleep, I picture it a hundred times. To Peter, the word daredevil is a dirty word. He violently objects to any comparisons between stuntmen and daredevils. A daredevil disregards safety measures and has no backup systems. That goes against the grain of dedicated stuntmen. The most important part of planning a stunt is picturing what could go wrong and to prepare for it mentally as well as physically. Once I land, bang, you take off right after me. Doesn't matter what happens. Okay? So, let's do it. Let's Come on. Let's do it. Good luck. I feel it in my mind if I can do it or not. And I think every good stuntman feels it. That's sometimes what you have to depend on. 
The practice jump will be the ultimate test. A 40 mile an hour run up the ramp produces a 70 foot jump. It answers a lot of questions and erases the doubts. This unique ramp where all surfaces are rollers works perfectly. It actually accelerates the boat. The only thing to worry about now is the weight of the jet engine throwing the boat off balance. He worries more about failing than dying. I feel better now that everything is taken care of. I have a good ramp. I have the best safety man in the water. Now, I'm ready. He's not very happy about the landing, but he did it. A new world record boat jump of 120 feet. He avoided a disastrous backflip by cutting down on the throttle at the last second. In 1977, the highest Peter had ever fallen was about 135 feet from a high rise in San Diego. The fall was staged for a commercial. Everyone was concerned about his overshooting the airbag from that height. He hit the bag squarely, but slid off to the pavement because the bag was so small. After that experience, Peter began planning a new kind of airbag, something far superior to any in existence, one that could be used safely for heights no one had yet attempted. Stunt men have been trying higher and higher falls than ever before, Airbags have not been improving at the same rate. In 1978, one of Peter's fellow stuntmen was killed in a 306-foot fall when his airbag burst on impact. Peter will be traveling at 85 to 90 miles per hour when he hits this bag. That's what he thinks about as he sews each seam. No wonder he trusts nobody but himself to make it for him. He does all the sewing himself with an industrial double needle sewing machine. Day after day, all day long, sometimes far into the night, he works on the biggest project of his life. The intensity he devotes to life is now focused on the creation of the giant airbag. This new bag will be used safely for heights undreamed of. Planning took two years. Sketches and designs were made and studied and modified again and again. Construction will take a year in all. The fabric is Cordura, an all nylon miracle fabric selected because of its incredible tear strength. Two strong men pulling together cannot tear this lightweight material. The thread he has chosen with extreme care. It is all nylon, as strong as fishing line. There are 12 miles of it. In his small apartment, the bag begins to grow. Soon it occupies most of his living space. Like a loving father, he unselfishly cares for it. His life revolves around it. The sacrifices he must make are a natural part of creation. He sews it in small sections. To join the sections together, he will soon have to take it outside to work. It now takes two men to carry, and he needs help pulling the material through the sewing machine. He completes the bottom half first. It's the safety airbag. It will stand eight feet high when it is inflated. For final assembly of the top and bottom halves, he needs three people and an open field. Now the bag is too heavy to move. Instead, the sewing machine must be carried around the seams. It does hold air, much to the delight of neighborhood kids. Inside, it looks like some giant ethereal stadium where Peter's crew installs the spiderweb network of support ropes. Without them, the bag is wild and uncontrollable. A special kind of fan had to be found 
to fill the 46,000 cubic foot volume of air needed. When filled with air, it's as big as an apartment building. Peter's dedication and skill have created a monument. Sometimes with stuntmen, it's difficult to tell where the hard work leaves off and the pure fun begins. Relaxation is just as valuable to them as their work and their training. Their working lives are filled with matters of willpower and nerve, confidence and prayer. The risk that they live with is unlike any other job. The pressure can take its toll on them, but not here. Away from the strain of training and working, life is very different. Stuntmen know how to have fun in many forms. This is one that can be shown on television. When Peter and his compatriots get together, there's always plenty of fun. Business is forgotten. Stories are swapped. Jokes are told. And there is always competition. This is the moment Peter has been working and training for, for years. It's a lonely moment. He depends on no one but himself to achieve his successes. And now he'll have no one to blame but himself, should he fail. To go. Everything's looking super. Yep. How's Peter doing? Is Pete ready? We're set to go here. Okay, stunt crew, camera crew, Peter is ready. Stand by, everybody. Peter is ready. Right. Roll camera one. Right, right. Roll camera two. Camera three. Cameras are rolling. Repeat, cameras are rolling. Tell Pete to go anytime he wants. Thank God. Yeah, Tell Peter we're sorry. Sure, I think number three camera jammed up on us. So I have no problem. Let us know. I got Peter here by the shirt. He was just about ready to go. We're standing by. Okay, I think they got the problem solved now. 
confirmation. Okay, bro, we're doing some last minute checks down here. Everything's almost day okay. All right, guys, let's bring the ladder and get over those, those air pockets. It's almost set. All right, get that ladder and over that air pocket there. Make last minute checks. All right. Get Tony and Mike hey, check on check that one more time. Okay, that guy tripped over. Tony checks All right, that's okay, guys. All right, Brad, everything's a okay down here. That's fully inflated. Okay, bring the ladder in. Okay, here's Brad on top. He did it. He succeeded. Excitement and relief drown out all other feelings at a moment like this. Joy takes over, shared by all the crew. For Peter, it's a triumph. He survived this time. Why doesn't he stop? Why try a higher fall? Why not quit when he's ahead? Knowing Peter, I'm convinced it's one thing, the challenge. So there will be higher falls and greater distances, but not today. He'll face dangers again. There will be more moments of doubt and worry ahead of him, but he'll meet those moments like he met this one. Love of adventure has always driven men to do awesome things. In their own way, men like Peter can expand man's knowledge of our world and our own capabilities. Peter Horak's way takes courage, confidence, and a great deal of excellence.